I used to go to these fly fishing shows and uh, demonstrate fly casting. And the first one I ever went to, I'm warming up for Lefty Craig. I was so nervous, you can't even you can't even believe it. I mean, I literally that was probably the most nervous I've ever been in my entire life. And you know, he was just so kind and nice. And I, I just remember uh, they had put us up at the same hotel and. Uh, I walk down and there's Lefty Cray sitting at the little Holiday Inn breakfast, you know, having his little cup of coffee and his, his food. And, and, and I was just like you, like with Bill Dance. I was like, I mean, do I go over there and talk to him? And, yeah. you know, we're, we're hired to do the same job, basically. But I was so young and inexperienced. So I walk over there and I introduce myself to him. And he's like, oh, come sit down. And he's the nicest guy ever. We had the best breakfast. He says, do you have a car? I said, yeah, I, I have a car. He said, would you mind if I rode with you to the to the thing? And I was like, of course, you know, and I don't know where I'm going. It's before cell phones and, and everything. So I remember it was kind of it was kind of a dreary old day. And he looked out the window and he kind of tapped his fingers on the window and he goes, well, a little bit of rain. And I was like, yeah, is that good? And he said, yeah, yeah, a little bit of rain always gets more people to come to something like this. And, and uh, he was just so nice and kind and funny and there were there were two sides of it and um you know you you he he would he would go into that that funny kind of kind of guy as soon as he got around many people but you could be there with him by himself and he was he was just really nice and he's somebody that had a tremendous impact on on all types of fishing and all types of outdoors and people don't even realize the things that he pioneered that uh, that we do today that are just commonplace. And if it wasn't for him, uh, it probably wouldn't be commonplace. He wrote so many books and he just introduced so many people to fishing. Hey everybody, welcome back to this week's episode of Impact Outdoors. And man, have we got a great show today. We have got one of the biggest names in the fishing and podcast world on the show, and Mr. Tom Rowland. And uh, this is a great episode. Super excited to have Tom on the show this week and uh, really been looking forward to this and so glad to finally be able to share this episode with everybody. Um, Tom's got a a fascinating career um, starting up in the northern part of the U.S. up near Yellowstone and uh, moving back down to Florida and how that transpired into to the tv world and now the podcast world and and as one of the founders of waypoint tv just how he is helping lead the way in how we gain access to new content in in the tv digital world so um great show there's a lot of cool stories in this and uh really glad that you're here to watch it with us today so if you haven't yet make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and you can stay up to date with all of our new content we're putting out. So with that said, let's get right to the show and welcome Tom on. Thanks. But uh, man, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be on Impact Outdoors today. Man, we really appreciate it and look forward to hearing you on the show today. I'm so, happy to do it. I'm happy to do it. Thanks for asking. So me. yeah, you're, you are actually one of the reasons that I'm doing this now. So I want to thank you for that. You're a big inspiration, you know, starting your show out and um, I've kind of been thinking about it for a while and and uh, I'll never forget, you know, when you first released your, uh, I think first episode was with uh, Chaston yeah. Whitfield. That was a good one. And um, and uh, just kind of went from there. Your, your show's really done good. Tell us a little bit about what you got going on right now. Um, well, like you, uh, it sounds like you had uh, kind of a desire to do the podcast and, and then something kept holding you back. And, and uh, that's, that's where I was. And I wanted to do a podcast. I listened to a ton of podcasts. I thought they were fantastic. I really had some ideas about cool things I could do with, with my own. And for whatever reason, I don't know, you know what it was? It was really the gear. Like I was real concerned about, oh, well, I don't want to buy the wrong thing. And I don't want to, you know, do have the wrong equipment. And um, looking back on it, it was just audio and it was really really much simpler than what I've got going on now with video and like what even what we're doing here is way more complicated than when I started but you know I I had lots of hesitations and I finally just one day I just I just bought all the gear and I didn't know if it was the right gear or whatever but that got me started and um and I wish I had started way sooner really it's uh it's been really fun fun to do the podcast but um you know the podcast is just a a small part of what 
I'm doing now. We have um, you know three TV shows. We have Saltwater Experience, Into the Blue, and Sweetwater mm-hmm. as our uh, as our main productions. And then we have uh, also Waypoint TV, which is occupying more and more of my time right now. Um, and and man, that is just going so fast. It's yeah. moving so fast. It's hard to even keep up with, uh, with what's going on over there, but, um, all of those things. And then the podcast and I'm just being you a never dad get to fish anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I fish, uh, I fish a good bit, you know, I, uh, I actually fish far more now actually with a rod in my hand than I did when I was guiding every single day. You know, yeah, when you're, when much. you're out there guiding every single day, you, you almost never get to fish. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I actually have, the rod in my hand far more than I, than I did when I was, when I was guiding all the time. Yeah. So I know you, you grew up back East. Um, Mm -hmm. what was, you know, everybody, everybody's got a story about, you know, growing up as a child, you know, fishing from an early age, maybe or hunting with their dad or grandfather or grandmother or mom or whatever, you know, what was kind of your intro into the outdoors growing up as a kid? Certainly my dad. Um, my dad took me fishing, a lot. Um, we fish for uh, largemouth bass and bluegill. Mm-hmm. I remember maybe one trout fishing trip ever, which seemed really exotic and uh, and it really got my attention. It was super cool. I had never seen a trout, caught a trout, so that was that was very cool. Um, but you know, I spent a lot of time with my dad in like some kind of little John boat or a canoe or or just sitting on a dock and. Um, we, we, we did a lot of fishing. Um, and then I started even liking it so much that I fished, you know, by myself on the Tennessee river, uh, just as a kid, just worms and, and crickets and stuff. And, um, that was, that was definitely my intro into the outdoors. So later I had another, um, kind of, uh, uh, kind of second wind, I guess, where, you know, there was, there was fishing with my dad and, and, that and then when i got old enough to have uh you know to get out kind of on my own i ended up going to yellowstone national park as a summer job and that that is really was was a real big change for me um i had never really seen the western united states i had certainly never been in a national park as much as as that and uh, had an opportunity to work at lake hotel and that really I mean, I didn't, I didn't know what all that was, but I knew I needed a lot more of it in my life. And, and that was really the beginning of, of a whole career for me. It was that, that summer in Yellowstone national park. Yeah. That was a, a long way from home. I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. It was <laughs> a long way from home and oh, big uh, country <laughs> full of, full of incredible, you know, things. I mean, you know, everything from geysers to bison and elk and mm-hmm. grizzly bears. And I mean, and just hiking and mountains and uh, Yellowstone's got it all. And yep. um, it was an incredible, incredible experience. And so much so that I've, I, I, I still say to this day, it's the best job I ever had. And um, I've sent so many kids to work there, um, you know, having this same conversation with people on the boat, uh, Mm-hmm. they're like, you know, how'd you get started? I tell them this story about working in Yellowstone. They're like, I didn't even know you could do that. I'm gonna tell my son about that. And sure enough, I get a call. Oh, now, how do you do that? You, what, where do you go? And, and you, you know, make the application to get a job. And my niece, my nephew, my son, um, and hundreds of other of clients, kids have gone there and worked. And I don't know a single one that didn't have the greatest summer of their life. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm, I, I've never been to Yellowstone. Been close, you but need uh, to go there. I, I know. I, I do remember we went to uh, Alaska when I was younger. Uh-huh. Uh, my dad's brothers worked up there, and uh, he was actually a, a grizzly bear guide uh, in Alaska. And I just remember the stories, and you know, we went fishing and all seen you know seen bears and stuff and eagles and all that. And uh, that always stuck out in my mind growing up. You know, it was like I got to get back there, and I've yet to get back to to Alaska, but uh, I am going back there someday. So and um but but yeah and definitely we got to hit yellowstone so sure. but um so working up there um i mean were you uh you know i know you was a guide up up in up in that area 
and that just kind of transpired into that or um, was it yeah later? well I, was, I certainly wasn't a guide in yellowstone national park i was right. the the probably the opposite of a guide i was cleaning toilets and yep. uh i was a maid and that's i mean that's what i'm saying is the best job i ever had it was amazing yeah i only had to be there for about four hours in the morning and they let you go when you when you had done i think i had 16 rooms to clean and when those were done i could go mm -hmm and do whatever. And I had never had so much freedom. I still haven't had so much freedom. It was amazing summer. But the next year, speaking of Alaska, I had this idea that I was going to go to Alaska. Um, and I didn't even know what I was going to do up there. And so I'm, I present this idea to my dad. And <laughs> he was like, oh, okay, uh, you're going to go to Alaska. <laughs> and, you know, he's trying to figure out some gentle way of kind of directing me somewhere else, because he knew if he told me, oh, you can't do that. And that's exactly what I probably would have done. So he, he was very gentle in his persuasion to try something else and ended up going to a guide school in Jackson, Wyoming. And, um, and that was my entrance into guiding uh, there. And I started guiding out of Jackson and stayed there uh, for seven seasons. Wow. Yep. And I know you've talked about it all the time, but this was during the fly fishing boom correct mm -hmm. yeah with the little movie that came out and everything right. <laughs> yeah that was a I, I don't know if that's going to be replicated i mean maybe maybe you know it, it i was talking to my friend uh about this the other day and this probably this year is the closest that we've seen to to that movie mm -hmm. um and the impact on on how it affects the outdoors and and the the people that are getting into the sport a lot of people have gotten into fly fishing after covid and uh, not just fly fishing, but camping, hunting, uh, fishing in general, uh, just biking, any general yeah. outdoor activities. That's what that's what there is mm -hmm. to do. And it's great to see that resurgence. But this is probably the closest um, kind of influx of anglers that we've seen in in any kind of fishing, but in fly fishing in particular. Um, but that year was you know, it was a real magic time because that movie came out, but then also the Gore-Tex waiter came out. There were big advancements in rods. There were uh, big advancements in fly lines. There were a lot of things that were better and made fishing, fly mm -hmm. fishing a lot easier um, for people to, to do. And that turned into, you know, a ton of people wanting to do it. Plus, you know, Brad Pitt on, on the big screen didn't hurt anything. Yeah. You know, a lot of people <laughs> wanted to check it out for that reason too. Yeah, I remember watching that movie when I was growing up, and uh, I didn't jump into fly fishing then, but uh, I did get I did get into fly fishing in college. Yeah, and it was something different, you know. I grew up in Oklahoma, um, just kind of like you know, growing up fishing for sunfish and bass, crappie, that kind of thing, and uh, looking for something else to do. And and um, I remember our school. I went to Oklahoma State, and uh, they actually offered a fly fishing class there um, during one summer. And me and a buddy signed up for it, and and uh went to bass pro and got us a, a cheap combo set and started going over to eastern oklahoma and the trout streams over there and um, mm -hmm. started catching trout and uh yeah. really got into it you know for several years and stuff and then uh and then moved down to texas and then the saltwater world down here just kind of blew me away with everything there is going on yeah you know? for sure so and that's the one thing i was gonna ask you about you know because i was thinking about this earlier just the difference growing up from an inland state, you know, and the op opportunities you have fishing freshwater and then going to the saltwater environment where it's species diversity is just insane. You, you really never know what you're going to catch and that kind of thing. And um, but there's always still a draw back to freshwater fishing for me, you know, even now, as much as I love fishing in saltwater. I mean, what's your what's your kind of take on that? I mean, you still well, I, I like fishing for anything, really. I mean, I, I really do. I like fishing for all different species. I think each one has its has, you know, a, a, a set of skills that you need to be good at that, uh, whether mm -hmm. that's bass fishing, you know, like like tournament anglers do. Uh, you know, that's very difficult. And and, you know, it's very competitive and they do some really cool stuff. And and I like that as well and and you know bass fishing on the on a uh, a golf course pond is one of my all-time favorite things to yeah. do um but i you know and then then you have trout fishing and fly fishing for trout is is uh it's an activity i mean it's almost like a different sport almost it's like it's it's different you know everything's kind of 
different. The skill set's different. The equipment's different. You know, the whole idea is is different. And then you know you have all the different saltwater species, and I I don't like any one really better than than others. I mean, I enjoy going offshore as much as I like being inshore. I like yeah. to deep drop. I like to fly fish in the in the salt water. I like to bait fish in the salt water. I I really you know try to to do it all. And, um, and I kind of consider all of the different, uh, tools that you need to be, you know, just kind of like golf clubs in a bag, like tools in a tool bag, you know, I mean, you got a five weight fly rod. That's good for some things. It's not good for others. Right. Yeah. Um, but I want to be the guy that you can, that can pick up a, a five weight fly rod or, a or, a, you know, a, a, you know, a kite rod for sailfish or, or a deep drop rod for swordfish or a, or a bass rod and be equally as good with any of them. And uh, really, you know, going for the best available rather than, and don't get me wrong, I had plenty of times where I was really laser focused on one species, on one type of tackle, and, and, and that's all I wanted to do. But, but now it's more like, man, uh, you know, there's a fish that is, that is really biting or happening right now. This is the best time for that. These are the best conditions for that fish. So let's, let's go for, for that. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't know, I, I don't really have much of a favorite. I mean, I have a few things that I like to do maybe a little bit more than others, but, um, and certainly there's some type of fishing out there that I, I don't really like, um, and try to avoid in fact. Yeah. Um, but, but, uh, I don't know. I don't, I just don't really have much of a preference even over fresh versus salt. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm good with either one, you know, it's, it's a good time to get out there. Yeah. I, one thing I miss so much about growing up in Oklahoma is, is, is the crappie fishing and, the mm -hmm. and, oh man, I mean, I used to do that every single day, you know, especially in college, you know, working and having the flexibility just to grab the boat and run out to the lake and, and, uh, go catch some crappie and stuff yeah. and, uh, but uh i do miss that but um um so uh after you you know you did the guiding thing up in montana and all that and, and you end up down in florida how did you and rich meet up together um well i started uh i started fishing in key west and you know things were going okay um i i was married well, I was married for part of it, but uh, I, I got married and things are going okay. We don't have kids. I'm working about 120 to 150 days a year, which pretty much any guide can do that. And there are some real benchmarks, or at least there were then with, with the amount of business that you were getting. This is pre-internet. This is really word of mouth fly shops. That's pretty much how you got your business. Um, and so, you know, to get to that 200 level, 200 days a year was, was, was pretty, pretty good. And to pick up those extra 50 trips, you had to start doing some, some other things. And I was kind of at this plateau of, of, uh, you know, this 150 kind of days. And, you know, most of that's tarpon season most, and then you got some right. kind of tourist trips in the, in the, in the winter with barracudas and stuff like that. But, you know, there are big holes in the, in the season, you know, September, October, you know, November, those are really slow months or they used to be. And um, so I was really looking for ways to, you know, how, how do you improve your reputation? How do you get people to want to go fishing with you? And one way to do that is fishing in the tournaments. And, um, one tournament series that they had in the Florida Keys was called the Redbone uh, Series, and it was mm -hmm. it was for cystic fibrosis. It was a great um, charity event, but it was also kind of it was kind of set up to help the guides. They had the tournaments at times of the year that were traditionally slow, right. and that that was very good for the guides. So the tournaments were like September, October, November was kind of the the three big tournaments for the for the um, Redbone series. So I started getting into those and sure enough, I did pick up a lot more trips like that because you would have anglers that would wanna book you for those uh, after you had done well in them, you'd have some anglers that would get serious about it. And then they would book you for some pre-fishing days. They'd book you for all three of those tournaments. 
and pre-fishing days all in, in between. So that's, you know, some extra days. That's like 50 days, uh, probably all, all total. And, you know, I was very intimidated because I was not, I, I did not feel like I was good enough to, to be in those tournaments at all. And, um, you know, lo and behold, I actually did pretty well in the first couple and I started to get more comfortable with them. And I started to seek out other tournaments because I started to, um, you know, experience more success because if I had won a tournament or, or placed in the top two or three or whatever, people started calling. And mm-hmm. you got to remember this is before the internet and you wouldn't even see that. Like if you place top, top five, or maybe you won a tournament, maybe there was an article in the newspaper, maybe, but then it would be like six months down the road and the red bone would put out like a, a journal or whatever. And it would kind of document this, this, this tournament that you would have. And then that would give you a lot of business, but see, there was this delayed kind of thing, like six months today, if you won something, uh, it would be, people would know about it like now it, yeah. immediately. And mm-hmm. it would be on Instagram and Facebook. And, and you would see this instant return back then. It was it was interesting because you wouldn't see that return right away. It would be six months, and maybe even next year, people would be like, "Hey, you won that tournament last year, or you did yeah. well in that one," and they would call you. So these tournaments, the more tournaments I did, um, the the faster I started learning, the better I started to become. I was it was translating into my daily guiding. It was translating into everything. I was getting more business. It was all great. So then I thought, well, if those tournaments are good, then are there some other tournaments we could do? And it was just when the redfish tournaments were starting. Mm -hmm. And so I started to look around at like who I knew it was a two man team and uh, you had to have two, two people to enter these redfish tournaments. So I started looking around at, at who might be a good choice for a partner and um, rich man at the time. I mean, we were neck and neck in a lot of these tournaments. Um, He was doing, as well as I was in, in all of these, he knew a lot of, he actually knew way more about redfish than I did because he fished in the Everglades uh, way more than me. And so we, mm-hmm. we did a couple of, uh, of, of trial trips going out and fishing together and we got along and um, we seemed to have kind of the same idea about what we wanted to do and how, how focused we were going to be on um, winning tournaments. And, you know, that, that meant that we were going to have to, carve out some time to go pre-fishing before the tournaments and uh, you're not getting paid for that. So, I mean, it's a big, it's a big uh, commitment. You're, mm-hmm. you're leaving at times that you're booked, you know, you've, you've worked so hard to get your, your bookings up and now you're going to tell those people that you can't uh, yeah. fish with them this year because you're going to go to Texas and try to learn how to catch a redfish in really muddy water. Um, which Mm -hmm. was very difficult for us, very difficult, but it was a real risk. Um, but that's how we got together. And, and that first year we did, we did really, uh, pretty well. We, we really did. We, uh, we, we started to, we started to win some and we started to place and we started to get checks and, you know, but it became pretty obvious that that is a very, very difficult way to, to make a living if you can do it at all, because like the bass fishermen, they have, a, a similar setup, but it's only one guy. So when one guy wins, he takes home all the money. Plus, mm-hmm. um, the money in bass fishing is, I don't know, 10, 20, 20 more, yeah. 20, 30 times more than, than the redfish tournaments and the opportunity to compete. I mean, today we have three tours going on. Um, and, and there's a lot of opportunity to compete it back in those days. It was just, it was two tours. I had the ESPN and the IFA, so very few chances to compete. And then the prize money was low, but I wouldn't take it back. It was, it was, there were a lot of uh, challenges. There were a lot of commitments. There was a lot of sacrifice, but um, it taught, it taught me a, a ton and uh, I'm glad we did it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I know some guys over here at fish, some of the current redfish leagues that are going on in texas and across the country and uh it is it's a lot of work you know and um, yeah and they're and most of them are all guides same yeah. same setup and uh um but uh you know they're 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 they do good in it you know well, good you enough know, if to you can go out there it, and so. you can if you're gonna have some tournaments that are in your backyard and you don't have to do a lot of pre-fishing or you're you're guiding 
you're pre-fishing while you're guiding, man, why, why not? You should absolutely yeah. do those. You might win 50 grand. You might win a boat. You might win uh, something. But when it's, when it's something that you're going to have to travel for, it makes it real difficult if, if you're, you know, if you're leaving a paying job to go and, and, and do that. So it's something you had to really consider. And I mm -hmm. had two little kids at home, you know, so it wasn't, that choice was not um, taken lightly yeah. at all. That was, yeah. that was tough. My wife thought I was crazy. <laughs> yeah. And like you said, you only got what one to two maybe days to pre-fish if that, you know, when you get there, well, I mean, you can, you can area. make it as much as you want back then there were, I don't know what the, what uh, the, the rules are now, but you could pre-fish as much as you want. Um, yeah. And some people would, some people would go there and camp for a month. Those are, those were guides that, that obviously they didn't have a job or, right. I don't know how they were doing it, but they'd go there and they'd fish for a month and you'd pull in there and <laughs> they got the place wired. And mm -hmm. you're like, man, how in the world are we going to compete with this? They've, they've, they've had two or three people up here scouting this area. And yeah. What are we going to do? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's where your skills come into play. So maybe sometimes yeah. some luck and luck <laughs> <laughs> over here. So as, as muddy as some of the water is sometimes you, it's a lot of luck, you know, you just got to sure. knock them in the head. So but um but we're used to fishing in dirty water over here every time i go to florida i'm just like <laughs> you know i was in yeah, Tampa. it's a lot it's a lot different but you know that can be a that can be as much of a um a you know, being a yeah. skilled sight fisherman can be a great skill to have but i mean if you go someplace where you can't see them you're completely lost and so mm -hmm. that's one of the biggest things that i learned is is how to fish for fish that you can't see uh, because we never did that at, at the yeah. beginning. We never, ever did that. And, and fish in water that's too deep to see the fish. And I mean, we were going as shallow as we could. And for, for us, that's just the way we did it in the Keys. And, and it was totally different everywhere else. Uh, Louisiana, everywhere, Texas, man, very, very different. But those were, those were skills we had to pick up very, very quickly. And, um, and they, they, they ended up paying off. But you just watch the boys from Louisiana and Texas and they'll show you exactly how to do it. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, um, man, that's the crazy thing about today is just the amount of, um, especially local tournaments, you know, there's so many tournaments going on over here and I'm assuming it's probably the same over there and a lot of fundraising tournaments and things like that. there's always charity. And, uh, it's, it's become a pretty big hot topic over here in Texas, you know, just the number of people on the water every weekend with, tournaments out of multiple marinas going on and you know, people can't book trips with guides because the guides are all booked up mm -hmm. you know and i mean i know my charter company took a huge hit um this year from the oil and gas side just because so many people are out of business a lot of those corporate tournaments were canceled this year mm -hmm. but normally you know we're you know running 10 20 of those a summer you know that we're that we're yeah. guiding at and stuff and um is it pretty much the same over there or well there's a lot of tournaments um uh, but I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's, uh, um, I think it helps, it helps the guides. I think that it, it's, it's a way that, um, if you're into the tournaments, you can book all those days. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't really see it as a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like doing them. It's, it's a lot of fun. Cause I mean, you know, they're, 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 the corporate ones especially because i mean they're not super competitive so the guys right. are really actually out to having fun on those trips and stuff and uh we, we we did one of the ones i did this this summer um that happened you know they they didn't even care if they caught anything you know and lo and behold we ended up catching a about a seven and a half pound speckled trout mm -hmm, so nice. they went in first place trout and stuff so they were they were super excited you know just just that that happened and and uh, so that was cool to see that and as a guide those are always my best trips that i look forward to the ones with with i won't say low expectations but just wanting to go out and enjoy the trip you know and not say hey you know we got to catch a limit and this and that you know and and um those always seem to be the most successful and fun fun ones for sure yeah so but uh so I know after, after the tournament stuff, you know, you guys were, were hot and heavy in that. And then, um, the TV show idea, I think came about because of some stuff that was going on during the tournament trail, right. With you and rich. That's exactly right. 
Um, we had a hurricane that came uh, over Key West while while my wife and two boys were in Key West, and we were stuck in Venice, Louisiana. And uh, man, I couldn't get out, and they couldn't get out, and it was miserable. Mm -hmm. And that was my last. Uh, pretty sure that was my last fishing tournament, uh, redfish tournament. I just decided, you know, I can't be abandoning my family like this. I'm I'm done with this. And uh, Rich is like, what? Wait, you know, like we've got all this. <laughs> got sponsorship we got this i'm like man i don't i don't i'm done i don't care like uh, i'm there are things that are more important and at the time rich didn't have a family yet so he kind of uh didn't really fully understand this he would understand it today um yeah. but you know i was like look i'm done so it's a long drive from uh venice to key west and um along that drive um we started to kind of hash out like what would we do and he just kept kind of asking questions like well, what do you want to do and i'm like well i'm going to be at home with my family every every night like i'm not doing this anymore i'm not traveling like this mm -hmm. and uh well how could we do that i don't know you know a few hundred miles go by it's like well maybe we could do a tv show like oh cool you you know anything about doing a tv show i was like well I've done like 30 of them. I, it doesn't look that hard, honestly. And uh, I was very naive. I had no idea what was what, what went into a TV show, but I had done a whole bunch because I had um, I had won the great outdoor games, the ESPN great outdoor games. And that opportunity opened up a lot of doors. There were a lot of people coming down to the Keys. It was an interesting story about how some saltwater fishing guide wins a freshwater trout tournament. And um, so it was, there was the hook was there. And bunch of shows came down pretty much a, a lot of them almost every one that i ever wanted to be on came down and um and tons that i had never heard of i mean i was doing shows uh rv today came down and did a fishing segment with me i mean all kinds of, like crazy things like that and um so i watched how all of these people did what they did and um and then i had a good mentor with shaw grigsby that was the first real TV show that I had ever been on. And Shaw, uh, man, he told me all kinds of stuff about how it worked. And he said, you know what, you, you need to go film a pilot and you can even borrow my people and, um, and go do it. You know, you'll have to pay them, but you know, they'll, they'll come down there and they'll mm -hmm. film it for you. They'll put it together. And, uh, he, we had no idea what a help that, I mean, at the time we were like, Oh, cool. Thanks Shaw. You know, but at the time, you know, had we had to go out there and find somebody, you know, cameraman and an editor and a director and all that stuff to help us try to put together some kind of a show, it would have been really, really hard. So that was a huge, huge help from Shaw. And, you know, Shaw continued to be a, a mentor um, over the years and, and has he's never shied away from from answering a question. And, and you know, you need people like that in your life. And Shaw is a Shaw is a really, really um just straight up honest awesome individual that uh that i'm lucky to have had as a you know in my corner a little bit yeah yeah and um, i've met him a couple times and he's just such a good down-to-earth guy i mean all those guys you know back from from when we were younger watching these guys on tv and stuff i mean you know those were you know heroes to a lot of us you know growing yeah, up you know no and uh and it's cool being able to interact with them and, and, and have them as a mentor for sure. I can't imagine yeah. that, you know, with Shaw. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's a great guy, man. I could never say enough nice things about him. He's, yeah. he's just, uh, he's just as, you know, he seems like a nice, genuine guy on TV. And then when you get to know him, he's even nicer and more genuine. I mean, mm -hmm. he's just, he's just a great, great guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I know you've, you've done a lot with, uh, you know, you did, you interviewed Bill Dance on the show. And, yeah. um, I remember the first time I met Bill was at ICAST, I think in 2015. And, um, I'd always wanted to meet him, never been anywhere where he was at, at the time until that year. And, and my wife was with me and, uh, we were walking by the quantum booth, I think. And, uh, he was just standing over there leaning against the counter. And I was like, should we go over and <laughs> say hi? <laughs> you, you never know. I mean, you know, I hate interrupting people if they're busy and stuff, but, uh, um, so we go over there and we talked to him for almost 30 minutes that day. Yeah. And I cast now after going for several years, I see how big of a, a weird coincidence that was to even have that long to talk to anybody. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, he's he another just, one that's just, uh, you couldn't get to be more down to earth. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's just, 
he's just a regular guy. I mean, he's very famous and especially walking around in that, in that place mm -hmm. in ICAST. I mean, he won't make it five feet before he gets stopped. Yeah. And, and, you know, they gotta, he's gotta take his meetings, you know, behind closed doors because literally people will walk up and take pictures with him while mm -hmm. he's trying to talk to the sponsors and everything. It's, uh, but he's, he's also been a, a mentor and, um, has, has never, never, um, not wanted to give me good advice. Like he, he is one of those guys that just, he'll just, if you ask him, he'll tell you, man. And, and yeah. he genuinely cares. And every time I see him, he's just like, just like a big grandpa, you know, he just comes yep. over and gives me this big hug. And he's just, <laughs> he's just like a, just a, like a great big old grandpa. And, yep. uh, and he's like everybody's grandpa, you know, I, I, like, he's got that kind of uh, personality and it comes across in, 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 on TV and it comes across when you're with him and he's just a, just a nice, funny, funny mm -hmm. guy that likes to help people. Yep. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I remember he gave me a hug and my wife that first time <laughs> we met him. I was just like, man, this is the greatest day ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But a uh, cool guy, you know, and growing up, you know, where I was from in Oklahoma, I mean, Jimmy Houston was, was everything, you know, to, uh -huh. to a lot of us, you know, and um, somebody from home and, and stuff. And uh, one of my uncles actually went to uh, school with Jimmy growing up and played, played ball and stuff with them. And, uh, um, but, uh, you know, him, him and, on too. Yeah. Yeah. And He's, um, man, I'll tell you what, man, Jimmy Houston plays this kind of uh country bumpkin character. He's no country bumpkin, man. That guy's smart. Like, like, scary smart in business he yeah. knows what he's doing he is he is a really really sophisticated businessman um and and don't let the don't let the haircut and the and the kiss and the fish fool you that guy knows yeah. exactly what he's doing and he's been incredibly successful in his career yep yep and uh he's a uh, um someone I always always looked up to you know growing up for sure so um but you know one, one of the other things i was going to ask you was um, you know, you've had a lot of, you've had a lot of different people on the show, on your podcast and stuff. And, um, you know, it seemed like it kind of started out initially as more in the fishing world. And, and did you, did you know it was going to evolve into what it is now? Because you're a very multifaceted show well, covering you know, lots when, of different When I guests started the podcast, topics. um, like I started trying to think of all these different names and I started trying to think about like, what is it that that we want to do. And even with our TV show, like our TV show is called saltwater experience. So mm -hmm. in some ways, saltwater experience, like pins you into, it should be salt. You should be fishing in saltwater. I think we've done one freshwater show ever and it seems out of place, but you know, I, I like freshwater fishing too. So when I started the podcast, I just kind of was like, you know what, I'm going to call it Tom Rowland podcast because I'm going to talk about what interests me. And of course, fishing is part of that. Hunting is part of that. Mm -hmm. Outdoors in general. But I'm really interested in people that make a living doing something that they want to do. And, you know, I, I seek these people out because they've, they're, you know, it started in the, in the outdoor hunting, fishing outdoors. But, you know, I see these people that are doing these really incredible, amazing things. And I want to know, like, how they did it. And that's fascinating mm -hmm. to me. Um, and, you know, fitness has been a real big part of my own career. Um, it was pretty obvious to me when I first started fishing in, in um, uh, Key West that I, I wasn't in good enough shape to do it, man. I, I couldn't, I mean, my friends were going out there seven, eight days in a row. I'd fish three or four days. I was like, I was wiped out, man. And uh, I wasn't taking good care of myself. I wasn't drinking enough water. I wasn't wearing sunscreen or the right clothes. Mm -hmm. all that played into it. But as I started to get in better and better shape, I started to be able to fish more and more and be able to put more money in the bank, you know, and it came down to that, like the better shape I'm in, the more days I can go, mm -hmm. the more money I'm able to make. And, and that was super important, not because I was getting rich, but because I could actually make it, I could be, this could be sustainable. Like, I mean, there are a lot of times when you're first getting started where it just doesn't seem like you're going to be able to make enough money to pay all your bills and, yeah. and keep doing this. So the goal was got to make enough money so that I can keep doing this so that I'm not, you know, negative at the end of the month. Like, 
And, and, and there were lots of years where there were not much money made, but I like talking about all of those things. And I like, um, you know, finding these different guests and, and uh, bringing them to the audience. And, and, you know, there's always some sort of a, there's always some sort of a hook. Like I, I got to uh, interview uh, Adrian Smith. He's the, he's the guitarist for Iron Maiden. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. but he loves to fish and he just put out this, this book all about fishing. So if I find something out about somebody, uh, you know, there's, there's the hook. Like I can get somebody like that on the podcast because they want to talk about fishing. That's what they are passionate about. Of course, he's passionate about guitars and rock and roll and Iron Maiden and all that. But it's interesting that he, you know, after the show, he would, you know, wander down to the river <laughs> and spend the rest of the night there by himself fishing for whatever was there in whatever part of the world or, or country mm -hmm. that he was in. And, you know, that's interesting. I find that, I find that cool. And, and I think the audience kind of likes that too, but you know, you create your own audience. Um, and, and as, as crazy as, <laughs> as I am about certain things, fitness and fishing and family and, you know, there are other people out there that, that are like that too. So I think that, uh, at least with the emails I get and the, the text from the people, they, they yeah. seem to like it. So I'll, I'll keep doing it. Yeah. So, um, and this might be a, a hard question to answer, but, um, doing the show, doing the podcast now, looking back, who, who do you think would be one of the the biggest interviews you would have liked to have gotten with some of these legends and, and people that have, that have already passed on. And, uh, cause I mean, we've, we've lost a lot of people recently and, mm -hmm. and stuff. And, uh, is there anybody that really sticks out in your mind yeah. that you really want? Yeah, to? certainly Lefty Cray. Um, you know, Lefty Cray is, he was another guy that I didn't have quite as close a relationship with as, as, as Shaw, but mm -hmm. you know, I called Lefty on the phone and talked to him and, and, he was another guy that was, he was, he gave me a lot of advice in the beginning of my career when I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. And, um, I used to go to these fly fishing shows and, uh, demonstrate fly casting. And the first one I ever went to, I'm warming up for Lefty Cray. I was so nervous. You can't even, you can't even believe it. I mean, I literally, that was probably the most nervous I've ever been in my entire life. And, you know, he was just so kind and nice. And I, I just remember uh, they had put us up at the same hotel. And uh, I walked down and there's Lefty Cray sitting at the little Holiday Inn breakfast, you know, having his little cup of coffee and his, his food. And, and, and I was just like you, like with Bill Dance. I was like, I mean, do I go over there and talk to him? And, yeah. you know, we're, we're hired to do the same job, basically. But I was so young and inexperienced. So I walk over there and I introduce myself to him and he's like, Oh, come sit down. And he's the nicest guy ever. We had the best breakfast. He says, do you have a car? And I said, yeah, I, I have a car. He said, would you mind if I rode with you to the, to the thing? And I was like, of course, <laughs> you know, and I don't know where I'm going. It's before cell phones and, and everything. So I remember it was kind of, it was kind of a dreary old day and he looked out the window and he kind of tapped his fingers on the window and he goes, well, a little bit of rain. And I was like, yeah. Is that good? And he said, yeah, yeah. A little bit of rain always gets more people to come to something like this. And, and, uh, he was just so nice and kind and funny. And there were, there were two sides of him. And, um, you know, you, you, he, he would, he would go into that, that funny kind of, kind of guy as soon as he got around many people, but you could be there with him by himself. And he was, he was just really nice. And he's somebody that had a tremendous, impact on on all types of fishing and all types of outdoors and people don't even realize the things that he pioneered that uh that we do today that are just commonplace and if it wasn't for him uh, it probably wouldn't be commonplace and he wrote so many books and he just introduced so many people to fishing that that's certainly one that i would have liked to have had on the podcast um another would be del brown mm -hmm. uh del brown you know, he, he caught more permit than, than anybody for the longest time fishing with, with Steve Huff. And those two, basically, Del Brown invented the fly that invented the sport. And uh, those two kind of paved the road for everybody. I did get to do a written interview with Del Brown a long time ago. Um, and he was another guy, you know, all these guys, they're nice. 
they're they're nice yeah. people and and uh, easily approachable. Uh, and when you look at them from a place of of being a young angler or or you know you're thinking, oh, this is like a movie star. Man, they're not they're not a movie star. They're like um, just a regular person. I mean, they like to fish. They like to they like to hunt. You know. But yeah. I would say those two for sure would be would be yeah. the ones that I would go to. Yeah. <laughs> i've got one in particular um and some people just never just don't didn't like the guy and some people loved him you know either loved him or hated him but with tread bardo was one that i was always interested in talking to um even before i started a podcast you know just somebody i wanted to meet and stuff and uh um but uh it was sad to see him see how his life ended up and him yeah. passing away recently but man but, what a what a stud that guy was oof, in, in the, back in the day before he was in a wheelchair i mean that guy would i mean he he would fish i remember seeing some show and he was fishing like 27 rods like i mean he just had so many fishing rods going out and he he said he had caught more uh big eye tunas big or eye tunas yeah. than any man alive and and man there are stories about him going out in little tiny boats and single-handedly just just i mean he he's a legend he certainly is a legend yeah. yep so that was one guy wish, wish wish i could have met you know but uh but live on on video so yeah. for for people to watch and enjoy so but um what you know you, you've kind of mentioned this stuff with um with the coronavirus and how that's affected the fishing and, and getting people outdoors because what better place to, to get away from big groups, you know, but, but, um, you know, over the last, I don't know, five years or more, we've seen the, the TV landscape change so dramatically. And you brought up waypoint TV earlier, mm-hmm. kind of tell us, of, you know, what got that started and, and, you know, I mean, how much more can it change, you know, going well, forward? I mean, cause it's, um, I think it can change to the to the degree that we have have no idea. We can't even imagine what what it will be. I mean, we so the waypoint is waypoint is a digital network. Um, what was once cable TV is now streaming. Mm-hmm. What was once uh, radio is now podcast. What was once you know, magazines and newspapers is now online written blogs and, and uh, waypoint is a network of all of those things. We have a podcast network. We have a, a video uh, streaming network. Um, and we have all this distribution that is, is really mind boggling. So when I first kind of came up with the idea for waypoint with rich, it was, uh, at a time where we were noticing serious erosion in the ratings on television. Meanwhile, the cost was going up. And I mean, it'd be kind of like, uh, I don't know, uh, any, anything where the quality of service is going down. You go to your local restaurant and they, you know, they used to serve you these huge portions and they were fantastic. And now the portions are really small and <laughs> And, and it tastes terrible, but it's three times the price. And, you know, it's like, what? Like, I, how can, I, I guess I'm just not going to come here anymore, but there's not that option. Like, there's no other place to go. Mm-hmm. So we started noticing this, this unbelievable erosion in the, in the number of, of people that are watching the show. And so we end up going to multiple networks. We solved that. We used to be on just one or two networks. We were on uh, uh, OLN at the very beginning and ESPN on the same weekend. And we would do, you know, five to 700,000 people would be watching between the two different shows that we had uh, just on a, just on a Saturday. And um, those numbers, they, they don't, they don't exist anymore. I mean, mm. those are good numbers for something like the voice or like, I, I don't know, big, yeah. big shows that you see now. Um, but, you know, we started to become, uh, to put the shows on more and more networks. So instead of just one network, we were on four or five networks. And, you know, that was working. We were getting the numbers that we needed to satisfy the sponsors. And everybody was, was kind of okay with it. You know, everybody was okay with the, with the change. But then I started thinking, okay, well, what about YouTube? What about digital? What about all these other things? 
And when YouTube, when I first started doing the YouTube stuff, um, we couldn't protect the sponsors. So we would do a show about fishing in the Florida Keys and there would be a Bahamas ad on in front of it. And that was, at the time, it was a big problem. I'm not sure it would be such a problem today because that's just the landscape that it is. But mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to protect our sponsors and we wanted to have these opportunities for people to see. Like if, if people are cutting the cord, then where are they going? And so I was kind of, building out everything I could Vimeo YouTube I was building a Roku channel and I was like this is crazy because we have a sponsor that would say well all this stuff you're doing that's really cool like how many people are watching it and so I'd have to go back and look at each one log into all these accounts and I'd probably forgotten the password and now it's like this big yeah. giant problem it took me a week to tell somebody oh well we had 25,000 people watch you know and <laughs> you just there was just no quick way to do it so the first idea for Waypoint was that you would have a place where you could upload your show once and it would go to all these different places. And then we would have a dashboard where we could look and we could see right there, like how many people are watching it. And we could report that back to the sponsors. That's, that was the simplistic idea for, for what it was. And we were like, okay, well, if we're going to do that, then that looks like an app and it looks like a website. And mm -hmm. so we built all that stuff out. And, um, you know, in doing this, uh, you know, we're doing that for a year or so, and then technology starts to change. And um, we, we start to, you know, investigate all of these different channels and opportunities for uh, getting the content out in different places. And now, I mean, there's so many places that, that the Waypoint content goes that it's hard to even, I, I, I really, I couldn't even tell you all of them right now. It's, we're adding new distribution all the time. And, uh, you know, something like um, a Samsung uh, Plus, you got, if you have a Samsung TV, you can watch a Waypoint channel on Samsung Plus. Mm -hmm. Apparently, everyone and their brother are doing that because the ratings are through the roof over there. So that's a free thing. So when people cut their cable and they can cut their cable, they can save $100 a month. They can go to, you know, Costco and buy a new TV, bigger, nicer brighter tv and they can have this whole network of samsung plus channels on there yeah. for free and they're still saving money and so that's really big and we got we got those kind of things um going and just continue to add this uh distribution both on the video and on the audio side with the podcast the podcast network is is available you know everywhere that you can find a podcast and then some and um, so it's just kind of a cool place um, for people to watch. If you're, if you're not familiar with it, you can go to waypointtv.com and you can see how you can see it on any of your devices, whether you've got Roku or Apple TV or uh, Samsung TV or any other kind of TVs. You can probably get the app there yeah. unless it's a really old TV. But um, that has, I mean, that has been really, really exciting. And um, how, where, where is it going? Man, that's a that's a question that everyone that <laughs> does anything remotely associated with with television or streaming media or a camera or a microphone wants to know. And um, you know, it's pretty obvious though. Just you know, we had the Super Bowl this recently, and a lot of the commercials on the Super Bowl were for these streaming apps. You know, you have Disney Plus that just came out. You have Paramount Plus was one that they were advertising on the Super Bowl. And, you know, you're like Paramount. I don't even, you know, I've, I guess I've seen that in front of movies and stuff like right. that. But until you start to see all the actors, I mean, they had all these different shows represented on, on there. And Paramount is going to take all that stuff and put it behind a paywall that they control. And that's what happened with, you know, The Office um, recently went off of Netflix and it's going on um, wherever the peacock or whatever mm -hmm. they're going to call it. And you're going to start to see a lot of this consolidation. And, you know, the fact, the fact of the matter is that um, cable companies make their money off of subscribers. And if they're not making and, and networks, networks make their money off of subscribers, I should say cable companies do also, but, if people are cutting the cord and those networks aren't making the money off of the subscribers, 
you know, they're giant buildings in New York and LA and everything full of really smart people. And if that business model is failing, they will find another way to make money. And the fact is that the consumer is the one that pays for all those big buildings and, and all that content. And it's, they're just going to change the delivery system. They will, I mean, like right now you can cut your cable and you can uh, watch Samsung Plus for free, um, but you have to buy a new TV and you can get Hulu and you can get Netflix and you can get Waypoint and you can have everything that you want to watch. Mm -hmm. But sooner or later, the cost of those, I mean, you've seen it with Netflix, the cost goes up a little bit and it won't be long before um, to have a real robust offering and, and see everything that you want to see you're going to end up be paying more than you were paying for cable. I mean, that's my forecast. The consumer, the consumer will be paying more eventually. Uh, and it'll be a slow kind of rise and you'll be like, and they'll, they'll bundle together, probably bundle together a bunch of these apps. So now you'll get Hulu and Disney plus uh, together or Netflix and a couple of others together. And you pay some kind of a, a fee that was comparable to what you were paying on cable and then it'll just start to slowly <laughs> rise then we'll be back in the same spot we were 20 I mean, years I, ago <laughs> I, I think I, I think i mean and that may be pessimistic but i i'm also you know being somewhat complimentary of those people uh that that operate in that industry they're they they make a tremendous amount of money they're very very smart and it's not they're not just going to roll over i mean they're going to be extremely creative it will probably benefit the consumer um, in, in, in ways of having better content to watch and having, having more shows and more things available to you. But, you know, where the rubber meets the road is that, you know, you don't produce Game of Thrones for free. You know, some, there has to be some, somebody's got to pay for that. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, it ultimately is me and, me and you you know, like mm -hmm. they, they, they bet on that. Like we're going to produce this ultra high um, cost show like game of Thrones. And we're going to get it back with HBO subscriptions. And I'm sure they did. Um, so it, I, I think that's where it's going, but that's probably, I mean, we could look back on this in 10 years and that would be the most naive thing that anybody could ever say, because there's probably a technology around the corner that we can't even imagine. I mean, I mean, who who would have thought that people would be listening to podcasts on their watch, but yeah. they do. I mean, <laughs> you told somebody that they were going to be listening to something on their watch 10 years ago. Nobody would believe you, but it's commonplace now. I mean, I look at my stats on the podcast and Apple watch shows up there like as one of the top devices. And that to me is crazy. It's weird. <laughs> I mean, five years ago, I mean, I wasn't even really listening to podcasts. You know, my right. wife's the one who kind of pushed me to get into listening to them and the and stuff. And and look now, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you got one, but, uh, and that's yeah. going to continue to happen too. I mean, they're more, you know, the the gateway to entry for podcasts or 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 you know, video production. You know, anybody can do it. You mm -hmm. you get a YouTube channel and off you go. What's changed is that it's harder and harder to get a, an audience um, for any, either of those things. Uh, you know, there are more podcasts coming online every single day. There's more videos being uploaded to, to YouTube every single minute from when I started that, com that, that uh, sentence till now, there's been millions of videos uploaded to, to YouTube. So it's very easy for years to get lost in all of that confusion. And, um, and that's the real challenge now, uh, uh, you know, yeah. just, Maybe six or seven years ago, you put something up there. I mean, I put a not video up on, on YouTube um, and it, it, I never did anything. I never promoted it. I never paid for any advertisement for it. Seven million views. Boom. Right there. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen anymore. Not to me anyway. Uh, there's, there's a game you have to play. And yeah. um, some people are playing it very, very well. Yeah, I, I am. I met a guy back in, I guess it was 2010, um, at one of the Texas brigades camps that, that I was helping with uh, the youth camps that you've helped out with this here at Coastal Brigade. But, um, um, it was Justin Rackley from, uh, the Guggen squad team. Uh -huh. And, um, he had just started doing his Lake Fort guy TV 
stuff on YouTube and would have never guessed. I mean, look at that guy now. I mean, he's one yeah. of the top ones in, you know, in the world, I guess. And, uh, um, just as so successful as, as he's been, you know, and, um, and, you know, he probably didn't see it at the beginning either, you know, but, um, he put something up now and it's just, you know, yeah. Instant. Yeah. I mean, like I say, some people are playing that game really, really well. All of those guys that he's associated with are doing that. And they also, you know, if you look at the people that are really, really doing well with a, with a few exceptions in the fishing world, most of them started about the same time. And that was quite a while ago. And they mm -hmm. rode this wave of, of people getting into YouTube and, and not to say that that's their, the only reason for their success. I mean, there, there's a lot of people that make great, great content and are, are really doing a, a great job with it. But there's, you know, you look at the, you look at the, the uh, established dates of when those channels launched and the, the really the biggest YouTubers have been at it for a while. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I think that that's the same with, with all kinds of social media. If you look at the, at the, the really big accounts, you know, they, they got on early and, you know, like Instagram, for example, it was really easy to build an Instagram account when there weren't very many people on Instagram and hundreds of thousands or millions of people are coming over there every day looking for accounts to follow. And now, I, you know, I don't think that that's why people get on Instagram. I think they already know accounts they want to follow and, and, mm -hmm. and it, it becomes, um, it becomes harder you know, to, to build a, to build a following. I mean, if we start a new show or a new account now, it's far, far, far more difficult than it was to, to build it up. Yeah. Well, um, I know you, you've done really well at the show and, uh, and now there's another TRP podcast on air with <laughs> yeah. your boy with Turner. How's that going for him? Well, it's, it's going great. I listened to one today. Um, he's really great at it. He, um, he, he's learning a ton and, uh, just like, just like you and, and me, you know, it's like, there's a lot more to, to, you know, calling something successful, you know, than just the numbers or, 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 you know, if you're making any money off of it or whatever. Um, I think it's a, it's a huge success for him because he's learning so many skills. He's, he's becoming a really good interviewer. He's, mm -hmm. he's able to reach out and get these people on his podcast. I just listened to this one with him this morning. That was him with the, uh, the chief geologist of Yellowstone that, that monitors what's going on with the Super Bowl. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And, uh, I mean, he's having really intelligent conversations with, with people of all walks of life and, and uh he's just a he's just a, a very interested young man and uh, it, for me it's a great way to uh when i miss him i can hear his voice you know <laughs> uh and and listen to him to have an hour-long podcast but mm -hmm. i think he's having a really good time with it and uh, yeah. i'm proud of him and it, it's really it's really good to see him doing something like that and yep. um, and it'll it'll grow for yeah. him so is he guiding any, any more up North or no, he, uh, he, both my boys now live in Bozeman, Montana. Okay. Um, Turner guided elk for, uh, a season and, uh, he had a very successful season. He, he put some elk on the ground and, um, I think he, you know, the elk season's short. It's not like fishing. Like, you know, if you're a fishing guide out West or whatever, there's plenty of days you can still, you know, get out there and go fishing. Mm -hmm. You're not probably not going to be booked every day, but in the elk season, you kind of are. And, uh, he, I, I think he likes to hunt more than he likes to guide. And, and when you're dealing with a very short season there, and, uh, yeah. I think you want to, you know, there's, there's something inside of you. that's like, man, that's what I want to be doing, you know? Yeah. Like, and, and I think that might be where he is, but he's, you know, he's, uh, he's working for a, a software uh, company and he's doing extremely well. And he's learning, uh, he's learning all about sales while he's also going to school and he's doing the podcast. And mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of things going on with that kid's life and he's, he's just doing great. So, uh, you know, I'm sure if he decides to guide, he'll do great at it. And if he decides to do something else, 
then uh, he'll do great at that too. Well, that's good. And uh, I know you're proud of him and all your kids with all the stuff sure. they've got going on. So, but um, you know, and that's a, you know, that's another, another big thing that we're always doing, you know, trying me and my wife doing over here, you know, is, and we've talked about it before is just getting youth involved, whether it's fishing or hunting or whatever, but, um, and that's just, I mean, it's cliche to say that, you know, that's the key to our future, but, but it is, I mean, and I hope that, that, um, we'll still be able to find ways to engage kids today because it is harder and harder and harder to do. And, uh, is there a lot going on down there, like in Florida, you know, with, with that or that, you know, well, of, or, you know, this year has been, has been really interesting with the COVID, um, you know, boat sales are at, at an all time high. Um, it's, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. You would think that, you know, a lot of people lost their jobs and a lot of people <laughs> had, you know, economic difficulties, but boat sales are, are through the roof mm -hmm. and there are more and more if people getting out one. on the water. <laughs> yeah, I know that's, that's the deal. Like they're, they're sold out. RVs are sold out. Um, you know, camping equipment is sold out. Bicycles are sold out. To me, that's the greatest thing ever. Like the, the challenge was getting kids into the outdoors for sure, because you were competing with so many other things like video games and, and, you know, the computer and everything else that you can do and social media and all these things that, that kids, you know, are, are attracted to. And, you know, for, for us, people that are trying to get kids to be interested in the outdoors, man, that's a hard thing to compete with. You're going to compete with Instagram. Like you're going to yeah. compete with, with uh, world of Warcraft and these, these, these incredible video games that they have serious scientists trying to figure out like what colors in the background do we use so that people will play this game longer? What, you know, I mean, there is like, there is so much that goes into all of that stuff. Um, and the idea is to keep people playing longer. The idea is to keep people scrolling through social media longer. And not only is it a bunch of smart people in a, in a building, but it's AI. And, and I, don't, I don't know how we can compete with it. We can't compete with it unless you, you, you convince the kid to put it down and look around because nature is better than social mm -hmm. media. It is, uh, but it's the, the challenge is how do you get them to put it down and become aware of their surroundings around them? And, and really for me, like it does come down to just put the phone away or, or even better than that. What's even better than that is, is don't tell them to put the phone away, just go far enough out where there's no reception and mm -hmm watch how fast they they drop it like a hot rock like when they lose that connection they'll sit there and try for a while and then it's like oh well phone doesn't work and you know put it away and and you know there are places that you can get no reception um lots of them uh and that that's you know that's my strategy as opposed to you know trying to uh to tell them not to um uh, whatever you push away from tends to be what exactly what they want. Um, so if you just go someplace where the thing doesn't work, then that's, mm -hmm. that's the best strategy. I think. Yeah. I mean, when we do our, our youth program over here and uh, you know, we tell them at the first of the week, you know, when they're there, you know, say, Hey, you know, we, we don't really want you having your cell phones, you know, you can leave them here. If you need them, come get them, you know, to call home or whatever and stuff. And um you know, every once in a while you'll see a kid that's just like, yeah, you know, it's like, I need, I need, a, I need my phone. I need to call somebody real quick, you know? And then, but usually after half a day, you know, at our, at our deal, man, we keep them so busy invested mm. in, into what's going on. You know, they don't even realize by the end of the week, they've already been there five days and it's yeah. time to go home. So that's um, great. I mean, yeah. that's really amazing that you're, that you're able to do that. So, um, you know, that's what they need. They need a, they need time away from the, they need time away from the devices and, yep. and, and it's, it's hard because the device doesn't want to, you to let it go and it'll do everything it can to keep you holding on to it. And 
And, and, and that's the truth, man. That is the truth. You watch that social dilemma, um, that mm -hmm. show on Netflix. I mean, honestly, I wasn't even that surprised. A lot of people were like, I can't believe that they're doing all that. It's like, well, you're hopelessly addicted. All of us are walking around hopelessly addicted to the phone. Like, think yeah. that's an accident? Like, there's no accident. They, they're, they're, they're engineering these devices and social media so that you want to do it more. And it's mm -hmm. obviously working. Look around. I mean, you can't drive down the road and not see somebody doing something on their phone. They're driving at 70 yep. miles an hour. And I mean, I'm guilty of it too. Like everybody, this thing is, it's super addictive and, uh, and, and you got to watch it, you know, and, and, if you can get a kid to put it down and, and pick up a fishing rod, then, you know, more power to you. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. And we need that to happen more um, just so that they kind of understand that there is more to life than, than, you know, a, a, a phone. Yeah. As long as they're watching fishing and hunting shows and stuff every once in a while, you know, I'm good with that. But yeah, uh, they will, but, but, yeah. but even then, man, it's hard it's, to compete it's, with them. It's you like give some of these kids, say, I mean, they're, they're going to be, you know, just, probably 22 out of 24 hours a day they've got their phone in their hand you know even when they're sleeping you know so but um i, I haven't seen one of the commercials on the super bowl you're talking about that earlier a cadillac or whatever has got a new car coming out with look like hands-free driving like cruise control i was just <laughs> like that's just asking for and so you can, for problems. So you can scroll through your social media feed yeah better so scary scary times but um well um I know we've been on here for an hour or so, but, uh, um, have you got, have you got anything big coming up? Y'all got any big, uh, trips planned as far as fishing? Well, I'm really, uh, excited that they, that they, um, announced that they're going to have ICAST this summer, this summer. Yeah, me too. So, um, you know, that's, that's big for us. Um, we're, we're finishing up the, the, the filming of all our shows. We're, uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to finish up, uh, into the blue. And uh, we have a few more shows to do for 2020. And then we'll start on the 2021 shows. We have a couple more shows for Saltwater Experience. Sweetwater, I think, is, is finished for the year. And um, so we're just kind of finishing those up, hopefully with some good weather and some good content. The, uh, the weather has been on and off um, fantastic sometimes. Right now, uh, it, it's, it's amazing. Uh, all, we had some amazing weather in January, so hopefully that will kind of extend into the spring. And, mm -hmm. uh, if we have amazing weather, we'll have amazing fishing. It's, it's, it works like that hand in hand, as you know. Um, yeah. but you know, a lot of times when we pull the cameras out, we have challenging conditions and, yeah. um, it's just the way it goes with the, either a fishing tournament or filming mm -hmm. a TV show. It seems like those are the worst days to be out there. Yeah, I know. We, uh. Me and my wife were blessed to be on Ronnie Green's show, um, which you know Ronnie, and uh, he came over here and we filmed here in Galveston, and um, we, beautiful day starting out, and then as soon as we got to our spot, 30 miles from the launch, we had thunderstorms pop up, and it rained all day long, and we didn't catch a fish to put on the show until probably 5.30 that night, oh. and uh, you know, it was just... <laughs> like it knew the cameras were coming out that day so but yeah. uh that's the way it goes that's the way it it goes more often than not yeah so but uh but well man i thank you so much you know for for being on um you're an inspiration to a lot of people you know you you've uh really made a lot of a lot of good things happen in the fishing industry and i know everybody appreciates that that follows you guys and um um hopefully we'll see you over at icast this summer and uh get to say hi and uh and um yeah and uh, who knows you ever get over to texas we'll get you out fishing so all right we'll go we'll, we'll, we'll hit some redfish in the head so oh, thank you thank you for saying but, all those nice things and thank you for what you're doing especially with the with the kids that's uh it's the most important thing right now man getting the kids out there and and those camps you're doing are making a bigger impact than you know so well, thanks for we, doing that and thanks for all the nice things that you said and i appreciate it all right, thanks Tom. Well, on. thanks, and uh, we'll, we'll see you later, bud. All right. All see right. ya.